Aloha and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Got Your Six podcast. This six-question podcast brings together high performers to share their methods, strategies, and ideas delivered in an informative and, most importantly, actionable way that will help you lead yourself and those around you from the battlefield to the boardroom. Coming to you every episode, I'm your host, Tony Nash. And into the breach. Nothing mentioned on this podcast is an endorsement or opinion of the Department of Defense. I got your six, we got your back. Got your six, we got your back. Got your six, we got your back. I got your six. Sixers, I will say this is going to be a treat, but I know this episode is going to be electric. We talk about sports here from time to time on the Got Your Six podcast, and one of the biggest stories of the offseason going into the 2022-2023 NFL season is just the dominant backfield and defensive line across the board in the AFC East when it comes to the Los Angeles Chargers. And we have the opportunity today to talk to Cole Christensen, West Point grad, field artillery officer, so you know, near and dear to my heart. Cole, thank you so much for being on the Gotcha 6 podcast today, brother. Absolutely, Tony. Thank you for having me. Excited to do this. Uh, absolutely. So being in the NFL, right, like that's just what you've been able to do, you know, how you've done that representing West Point. I have to just before you even ask any questions, commend you for that, because the dedication and commitment to craft is unparalleled to almost anything else in life. Thank you. How do yeah, you it's been... go ahead? No, you go ahead. After you. How do you take what you've learned, you know, not only from your time in the Army, but West Point and apply it to what you do daily, you know, whether it's in training, in the off season, or, you know, during practice as you get ready for a Sunday, Saturday, or Thursday game? Yeah, the cool thing is it's it's all completely compatible. So, like, being on the football field or at West Point or in the Army in general, all of it's just being on a team and working with others. And I think taking those skills I got at West Point and then taking them to the NFL, it just works so well because you, you're always just building relationships and – you know, the coolest part really is, like, all my teammates are always asking about the Army stuff. Like, dude, tell me some of the stories from school. Like, what is it like? And I'll give them some of that. But really, I just try to tell them, like, my leadership lessons I learned at school and, like, how I can apply them to, our, like, us being a better team, a better cohesive unit. And it's so cool seeing them take it in stride. Even guys that have been in the league for, like, 10, 15 years, uh, constantly just learning and taking new stuff. I'm taking stuff for them. But... You know, I, I always say I must learn more being a West Point football player um, as far as leadership goes and just how to be on a, a successful team and organization than I even I did from the cadet life because just learning how to function and work well with your peers, I learned that more in the football field, honestly, and I'm still learning every single day in the NFL. And that peer leadership is so uh, universal, regardless if you're in you know, cor- the corporate world, in the Army, or you know, on the field. Um, what can you give us a story of where somebody you know asked you a question about being in the army where you've been able to kind of talk about peer leadership and it kind of almost, it knocked their socks off yeah well i mean usually i think the the best lessons i learned probably were you know the days at camp buckner uh, i got to be a first sergeant one summer and just they, they were actually older than i was so that was a pretty big learning curve for me is how can i effectively communicate to these kids that are one year, two years older than me, uh, and, and have them trust me and respect me and, you know, get through the summer together. And there was, there was actually, uh, his name's Linval Joseph, uh, he's significantly older than me, but he was asking me about some of the stuff I learned at school. And um, I told him about that summer, and he just thought it was the coolest thing in the world. And uh, he could see it, like, manifesting itself on our football team because I was sharing stories, like, as we were going through the season. This is my first year there, or I said this two years ago to him. And I could tell he really he really liked that story. That, that's incredible that you're still able to have this connection um, and use those you know lessons learned from Camp Buckner, which is like the second summer for those who aren't familiar at West Point, uh, and continue to apply those leadership lessons lessons day after day after day. What really influenced you to look into West Point or come to West Point? Was there you know someone in your past or kind of tell us about that? You know. I actually never wanted to be in the military growing up. Like I, I always, uh, I was very prideful to be an American, and I, I really, I obviously respected the armed forces my entire life. But 
Uh, it wasn't until I started going through the recruiting process for football that I even figured out what West Point exactly was. Like I always heard about it, you know, how uh, distinguished it is and uh, had the utmost respect for it. But when they recruited me and took me, I actually took three visits up to West Point. And on the third visit, I said, I looked at my mom. I was like, I will regret this the rest of my life if I don't come here. Like, this is the spot for me. And I got to talk to so many old grads and just all these officers that were up there. And they told me the impact that West Point had on their life and the impact it continues to have after their lives in the Army. Uh, I said that this is the spot for me. And I haven't regretted it since. And, my, you know, my mom actually, she was terrified when I said I wanted to go to West Point. She wrote the defensive coordinator a list of 100 questions. I'm not even kidding, 100 questions. And she wanted all of them answered before I said yes. And I thought she was crazy. I was like, they're going to drop my offer for just for this burden that he's undertaking. But he answered every single question. And uh, I knew exactly what I was getting myself into. And it to this day, like NFL, all of it, West Point is the best thing I've ever done, probably ever will do. That's incredible. Is there a question that you remember from that list of 100 that she asked? Uh, I'm sure you could imagine at least 50 of them. And a lot of it's like, what is his life going to be like in the Army? Is he going to get deployed? Is he this and that? And and they were, you know, as honest as he could be, he's like, well, it depends on what his job is and where he goes. And, you know, he's coming here to train to be an officer in the Army, and he's going to have to do that job. And I was totally ready for it. Like, I, once I, especially once I got to West Point, I was like, this is what I was meant to do. And it is still what I'm meant to do. Like, once football's over, I am going to serve at least five years and go do the job that I learned to do but uh yeah she everything you could think of i mean just imagine a a terrified mom anything that that mom can think of (laughs) so no that's that's awesome and it's such a mom a mom flex i absolutely love it because my mom would do the same thing um so now that you know you're you're going into a new season in the nfl how are you constantly finding ways to challenge yourself and continue to get better yeah that well, so for me, like I've been on the practice squad, active, you know, bouncing back and forth my whole time in the NFL. And that's really the constant motivation is to make this 53 and stay on it the entire season and earn that starting job no matter what role it is, whether it's at linebacker, if it's on every special team. So that's always the driving motivation. And then beyond that, it's seeing the guys around me, how hard they push themselves. I mean, the, the level that these professional athletes – push themselves is just incredible and it motivates me every day I'm out there just watching them work their craft and you realize how good these guys are I mean like just to to cover uh some of these dudes out of the backfield or run with Tyreek Hill for the Chiefs downfield like you realize if you don't give it 100% every single day you're gonna lose so I don't really ever have a lack of motivation to get better but I think the hard part does come like right now in the off season when you really don't have any responsibilities other than to make yourself better and the coaches completely back away so like the season ends and they say all right we'll see you in six months whenever we come back enjoy yourself but when you come back you're fighting for your job just like you were and you're leaving now so it's these like four to six months where you're just sitting home alone and it's like all right i gotta wake up and earn my spot right now because even when no one's looking this is when the money's made um so that's been it was a challenge more last year i think because you know leaving west point you don't have any free time so when you get to actually sit down and decompress i was like wow this is amazing like i've got four months just to chill out and then like two weeks went by and i was just bored out of my mind i couldn't believe i had been so sedentary and uh and then i got back in the lab and started grinding so last year was a good uh first test run in the off season and i think i'm kind of in my stride yeah no absolutely and like you said you never know when that knock is going to come on the door and you have to be able to distance that away from like you know somebody putting their finger on a doorbell Right, and being able to distinguish those two things. Um, because you, if you get called off the bench, you have one opportunity almost, you know, go back, m and I'll date myself a little bit, uh, the mom spaghetti on your sweater kind of thing. Yeah. Right, like, how do you mentally prepare for that moment when you do get called off the bench, as you have been many times, um, to just kind of not only enjoy the moment and embrace it, but not get too far ahead of yourself and, like, you know, overthink the situation. That probably is the most interesting battle throughout the season because, and the wildest part is they'll tell you basically the day before, even the day of that you're getting up. So I'll, I'll practice the whole week and not really know if I'm playing or not. And then 
the night before at the hotel, whatever city we're in, it's like, hey, you are up tomorrow. So lock and load, we're rolling. And it's really easy to psych yourself out. And like, all right, this is my one chance. If I blow it, like I'm never going to play again. But I learned after my first game last season, and, and it's the same way in college and in high school, like you have to treat it basically like it's practice. Like you go out there and you're going to do your best. But if you make the moment bigger than it is, you're not going to perform well. Um, so I would, you know, I get in my groove and I'm getting fired up. But when I hit the field, I just look around and soak it all in. I'm like, man, how cool is this? Like just – and when I when I do step back and enjoy it, I play my best. So that whenever every time I get pulled up, I just re- remind myself that this is a game. Uh, it's supposed to be fun. Yeah, it's stressful and it's your job. And obviously, they're grading your performance, so there is a lot of a lot of stress on it. But you step back, say, you know what, I'm gonna have fun today. It ends up being okay. Now you talked about your mental kind of cues that you go through. Is there any like physical cues or anything that you kind of do to kind of stop? and say, all right, we need to just take a quick tactical pause before we go into this? Or is it all just a mental thing at that point? Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of physical. Like, I've got a pretty intense, well, not intense, but a pretty methodical routine like the night before, like physical stuff. Like, I do a lot of breathing techniques. Uh, I've got like a series of videos I watch, obviously. And, uh, and then on game day, uh, I, go th- I get to the stadium like three hours before the game, sometimes even four hours. And I go through like a cold tub, hot tub deal just to get my body ready. Uh, I roll out, but like while I'm doing it, I'm listening to music. And there's a couple different things I do just to try to calm my body down because naturally it wants to get tense before it starts. So I'll do a couple things like that just to to loosen up. Not even like physically loosen up to run, but just to relax my body and my mind. Sure. Now, let's. I want to kind of break some of this down. What When you talk breathing um, practices, what are we doing? Like a box breathing or... Um, it will sort of like for me, and I don't know if this scientifically is how it's supposed to be, but I'll actually do like really quick breathing early on just okay. to like flood my muscles and everything with oxygen. And then as I get closer to game time, I'll basically just meditate. Like I'll sit against the wall and close my eyes and just into the nose, out the mouth, like big, slow, deep breaths. And I'll do that for like 15 or 20 minutes while I'm listening to my tunes. And that just like really calms it down. But I like to flood everything with oxygen like 45 minutes to an hour before it starts. What, what jams are we listening to? What's, what's cranking in the headphones? You, honestly, it depends on the day. Like okay. when, when I was in college, I, like, I had to listen to like the exact same songs in order or else I wasn't going to play good, which is the craziest thing in the world. Like I had so many superstitions in college and high school. Like If I had, don't do these things, it's going to be a bad day. Yeah. I dropped that because in like my first year in the pros, I tried to do that same stuff. I was like, dude, you're psyching yourself out. Like, you didn't put your eye black on the right way. You're not going to play well. Like, I just ditched all that stuff. Um, but it depends. Like, I'm a rock guy. I'm a rap guy. It just depends on the mood. So anything from, like, what kind of rock? Are we talking, like, heavy, like, Metallica to, like, Benny the Butcher when it comes to rap? Or where are we at? <laughs> Sometimes. I mean, usually, like, I'm a, I'm a classic rock to okay. kind of 80s, 90s heavier rock. So... I'll throw on some Motley Crue. Sometimes I'll throw on, you know, like Zeppelin and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, Nirvana some days. Sometimes I'll even listen to reggae. Like if I'm spiked up way too high, like I'll throw on some some Marley or Revolution or something just to calm it back down. It's just a constant game of like hitting that perfect flow spot. Now, speaking of the flow spot, and you got you got to my next question. How did you kind of figure out? where that where that flow spot is where that sweet sweet spot is well some i mean it, sometimes i don't hit the mark which it kind of sucks when that happens but it's like the perfect it's really just getting to where i'm happy like i'll i'll know if i'm about to play well if i just feel happy if i don't feel like if i'm too excited then i'm tense and i'm stiff out there but if i'm if i try to mellow down too much that i'm lackadaisical uh I, I honestly don't even know if I've hit the spot until I start running. Like if I just get out there and warm ups and I feel like, okay, the body is where it is, where it's supposed to be. And it's all in the head. And like, if it's, if my head's right, my body matches it. Yeah. And uh, that's when I'll change the music up. Like if I feel like I'm stiff, you know, I'll, I'll calm it back down, vice versa. Now understanding that happy moment, right? And that, that gratitude moment of, like you said, when you walk out on the field in front of, you know, 70,000 plus people all screaming, um, is that probably the, the biggest 
belief or understanding, you know, self-awareness piece that's really kind of imp- impacted your life, especially now being in the pros, or is there something else that you would attribute that to? The happiness I feel? Yeah, like understanding your happiness level and like hey, knowing kind of where that where that is, that range, or is there something else that's really kind of impacted your life, especially after West Point or, you know, over the last five years or so? Um, no, it's just... It's been a, an accumulation of all my experiences, I think, because I think West Point really made me find that happy spot because, I mean, you know just as well as I do, like how deep of a rut you can get in your mind at school uh, and figuring out what I need to do to you know boost that serotonin and get back to that sweet spot, that happiness. I think those four years at school probably is where I found what that feels like to be in that perfect happy spot. Um, and the things I need to do to get there. And then in the pros, I just brought those same things to game day and figured out where that spot was and what I needed to do to get there. And you talked about, you know, when you sometimes miss the happiness spot, it does show itself as failure. What failure has ultimately led to a great success in your life? Um, you know, I'll, I'll probably... S- our senior year, like when we started losing games again, um, there was a lot of a lot of things that went wrong that year. But I'll take a lot of the blame. I could have been much better as a leader, truthfully. I think uh, I could have been more vocal in times that I wasn't. I probably talked out when I shouldn't have, and I took a lot of those lessons from our senior year and things that I could have done better. And uh, I don't have a massive leadership role. Obviously, it's a little different when guys make two hundred million dollars and they've got five kids it's a little different talking to them nowadays but um i think growing from that senior season and the things that went wrong and how i could have done better i think that's led to more success now in the pros even as like the role i have just how i interact with my teammates and my coaches uh i think i'm a much better player and leader after going through those pitfalls my senior year at school yeah, I think you should give yourself a little bit more credit too, my man, because like knowing when to actively listen to what other people are saying, regardless if they make two hundred million dollars or it's a coach that's been in the you know been playing around or around football for fifty plus years, like recognizing and having someone understand that you care what they're saying, I think pays off massively, and that's why I think you're such a valuable piece of what the Chargers are doing over in the NFC West or AFC West, excuse me. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, because like no, I think you're, I think you're totally right, and that's gonna. Good. No, it's you. Uh, I, the one that's one of the coolest things about the NFL. Like I thought the egos were gonna be so massive that no one would ever take a second to listen to someone who's undrafted, but it doesn't really matter who it is. Everyone's just completely down to earth. I mean, ninety nine percent of the guys are super down to earth, and they're willing to listen no matter what. Like I told you the story of Linval. You know, he makes however much a year. He's been in the league for ten plus years, and he still took the time to listen to what I had to say. So that, that has been cool. There are, I mean, everyone is an active listener, especially in our organization. It's such a, um open and cohesive group. There's not really a massive power hierarchy and you got to, there's no super chain of command, but the, the coaches listen, the players listen. It's, so it's really good back and forth. Yeah, and it goes back to what you were talking earlier too about being at Buckner, right? And that peer leadership where everyone is equal. More, more or less, right? Um, regardless of how right. it's spun on TV for, you know, whatever, by position. Yeah, everybody contributes equally. And you can see it from a distance, like, as a, as, a, as a fan, right? There's different organizations that just get it. And like I said, I think what you guys are doing over there is something super special. Now, Cole. I as, agree, 100%. At, okay, good. It's not just me. Um, as we kind of wrap up, right, I have to ask you, and I ask all the guests that come on the Got Your Six podcast, Cole Christensen, how are you better today than yesterday? Well, you know, today, uh, <laughs> what did I, so actually, I went, I sent it before I did this, I was at my grandpa's house, and um, he's got like a whole bunch of shrubs, it's like all in the back of his yard, and my grandma died recently, so he's been by himself and he's been kind of low. Uh, but I went over there and cut all his shrubs down. And then him and I 
sat down and had lunch and just sat in the backyard for like two hours and talked. And we hadn't done that in so long. Um, I feel like I'm a better person for that because, well, to me, family's everything. And since I've been at West Point, when you can't connect with family as much as you probably like to, um, I kind of dropped the ball there for a while, just communicating with my loved ones. And it's hard in the pros when you go across the country and you're not with them and you're always working, just staying in touch. Uh, I realized a few months ago I need to be way better at that than I am. So today was a, a pretty good deal to go and see him for a while. Um, so those kind of touchy-feely things, I think I'm a better person today than I was yesterday. Dude, I, I, first off, our condolences to your family about losing your grandmother. But that is an incredible story. And oh, yeah. Appreciate that. Absolutely. And recognizing no matter where you are or what level you're at, like family, you're like a family dude, and you're always like, how can I continue to improve these relationships for the people that have always had my back? I absolutely love it. That's it. Cool. Thank you so much for coming on, sharing your strategy, your methods, you know, especially at the level that you're at. And most importantly, thank you for having our six, but I really appreciate it. Absolutely, brother. Thank you. I don't know what you've been told, Sixers, but the lawyers would like us to remind you that the views, opinions, and comments expressed on the Got Your Six podcast are solely those of the hosts or guests to include current and previous Department of Defense employees and should in no way be considered the opinions of or endorsements on behalf of the Department of Defense or any of its components, divisions, contractors, or other current and previous staff members.